I want to talk about next are general rules that apply to photographing any type of scene. It doesn't matter what the scene is. It doesn't matter if it's a homicide scene, a suicide scene, a, an arson, an assault. These are just the general rules that apply to all crime scenes. And then what we'll talk a little bit more about towards the end of tonight are some of the specifics about photographing, for example, a body at a homicide or a body at a suicide or, for example, a victim of sexual assault. But these first things we're going to talk about are the overarching uh, rules that apply to all scenes. All right? So some of them. Uh, first one, photograph the scene as completely as possible. What I really want to emphasize here is remember that just because the incident occurred in the living room of the home, that's not the only area we're going to process. It's certainly not the only area we're going to photograph. We're going to photograph all the adjacent rooms. We may even need to photograph the exterior of the home. Uh, we may even need to photograph up and down the streets if the person took off running, for example, and may have deposited evidence as they took off. So we, we photograph everything. We need to pay a lot of attention, and I'm going to focus more on this in a, in a few minutes, on the path of entry and exit. And I'm going to talk about why these are so valuable in just a few minutes. As I just mentioned, we're not only going to photograph the area where the crime was committed, but all adjacent areas as well. Again, if it's a crime that occurred in the home, if it's in the back master bedroom, that's not the only room we're going to photograph. We're going to photograph all the rooms surrounding that back master bedroom. Now, if, if it's a two-story home and we know that the person never went upstairs, we may not photograph the upstairs. But we're going to photograph any area that has relevance at all. Whenever we do photograph a room, we photograph the entire room, floor to ceiling, making sure to show all four walls, the floor, the ceiling, any evidence. And to do that, we're going to have to use a variety of different angles and different types of lighting. You guys got these written down? Can I move forward? I want to talk about the path of entry and exit. All right. So I've set up just a, a little mini crime scene here, right? So let's imagine that this that this room uh, is um, uh, the the first room you were coming to in a home, and let's imagine that this opening here. Let's imagine this was the doorway to the home. So imagine there's a door here, and someone busted into the house, and then they committed the crime. The mistake that uh, an inexperienced crime scene processor might make or an inexperienced police officer might make is, is to think that the best forensic evidence is going to be found right at the body or immediately surrounding the body. Now, don't get me wrong. There's evidence there. But in actuality, the evidence that you're more likely to find that is most likely going to allow you to link the suspect to that crime is going to be found at the area of entry and exit. For example, remember I said before, let's say we have a doorway here. So this is the front door of the home. Think about someone trying to break into, just think about your home. Someone's trying to break into your home, right? What's probably the first thing they're going to do? They're just going to see if the door's unlocked, right? So they're just going to walk up to the front door. They're going to jiggle the hand, right? So immediately, what do we have? Fingerprints. We have fingerprints, exactly right. So we have fingerprints. All right, so, okay, let's say you were smart enough to lock the door. What are they going to try next? Kicking. Right? They're probably not going to kick it at first because they don't want to, maybe you're in the home, they don't want to disturb you, so what might they try instead? Window. They think there's a window, right? They might, if there's a small window next to it, they might maybe break the window. All right. So now we have, if they have a broken window, we have broken glass. But also, if they weren't careful, we might have what? We have blood. We might have cut themselves, so now we have DNA. Or even, I'll get to your question in a second, Jeff. Let me go through this quick first, okay? Yeah. So maybe they reach through the window and they try to grab the door. Maybe the shirt gets caught on that broken glass. So now we might have trace evidence, maybe hairs or fibers. But glass, hairs, fibers, fingerprints, maybe some blood. Maybe they couldn't quite reach the door. So now they're frustrated. All right, now they're going to try to kick the door down. So they kick the door. So now what do we have? Footprint. A big old boot print or shoe print right there on the door, right? 
Maybe that doesn't work, so they grab a pry bar, they jam it in the door frame, they try to pry it open. Now we have what? Tool marks. Tool marks and typically paint, paint chips. Where is all of this evidence found? The entryway. Right at the entryway. It's nowhere near that victim. Here's the, here's the rub. Sometimes our officers, our first responding officers, forget about how valuable that point of entry is. Because when you secure a scene, one of the things you want to identify quickly, if you can, is where is the most probable point of entry? Because that area needs to be super secure. And that is one of the first areas that needs to be processed before we enter the home. And if it's a home, people who are entering and exiting the scene should not, in fact, come in and out of that entryway. So if you had, for example, almost all homes have a front door and a back door, right? So if we know that the person broke into the front door, we should be having, for example, if we have EMTs, we would prefer that those EMTs come in through the back so we can secure this area. And when we go to start our photography, we need to spend a lot of time photographing this area. So if this is the front door, before we enter the scene to start processing the inside, because remember, we always process from outside and work our way in. Before I start photographing anything inside, I need to do a really good check right here at the entryway. Are there any obvious signs of forced entry? Are there any tool, mark, any tool marks on the doorway? Any paint chips? Is there any broken glass? Are there any obvious fingerprints? And photograph all those things. Now, there's nothing obvious. I, I take photographs as is, and then I can move into the scene. But then my late print person can come in behind me and start processing for prints. Right? So again, we move through the scene in sequence. Now, Delia, you have a question? Yeah. Are there latent footprints? Absolutely. This floor is covered in shoe prints. You just can't see them because they're latent or hidden. And we have techniques to be able to make them visible. Would that be part of uh, evidence or process? Certainly. Yeah, like that? Certainly. All right. So entryway, very important. All right. Other rules that apply to all crime scenes. As I mentioned before, and we have it listed here in the slide behind me, we work from outside in. So in our, in our crime scene here, with our dead body lying on the floor, if I'm a crime scene photographer, this is not where I start, right? I may not get to this body for hours. Let's think about, let's think about this room. Another thing it says here in our list of, of uh, rules for crime scene photography is you need to tell a story with your pictures. So think about a picture book, right? Think about you're making a picture book and you're trying to tell a story with the photos. So think about putting photos in a sequence and that sequence is relevant to telling the story. Think about if you were trying to relate to me the location, first of all, what this item is. We have a body on the ground here. Let's say you needed to tell me what this item is and exactly where it is, but you couldn't say anything to me. All you could do is hand me a stack of photos. Right? Let's think about the photos you would take. What would be one of the first photos you would take? So Phoenix College, right here at Phoenix College, we have a dead body in the other room here. And you need, to, you need to relate to me the fact that we have a dead body here in this room. And you need to, you need to tell me all that without actually saying anything. What would be the first photo you take? Outside where it says Phoenix College way in the corner. Okay, so <laughs> you're on the right track. The first thing is outside. Yeah. Work from outside in. Before I took a photo of the Phoenix College sign, because not everybody knows where Phoenix College is. Street time. I would take a photo of the street sign. Exactly. That street sign right there in the corner that says 11th Avenue and Thomas. Because immediately, if I handed you a photo that said 11th Avenue and Thomas, if you know anything about the layout of Phoenix, you, you start to know immediately, okay, now we're talking like Midtown Phoenix. What I would do next is I would take a couple of photos from that corner, looking down Thomas, and then looking up 11th Avenue. What that would do then is it kind of gives you an idea of the, the type of area this is. Is this a, a suburb? Is this a city area? Is, a, is, it, is this rural, so is this on a country road somewhere? So first of all, that street sign, the street sign's a really important one. Then up and down the streets. The next photo I would take 
would probably be that sign out front on Phoenix College's campus at Phoenix College. So now we know, okay, oh, 11th Avenue and Thomas, that's Phoenix College's campus. What would you do next? Yeah, the outside of the building. Photograph the outside of the building. Making sure that you photograph the sign on the outside of the building that says E building, science building, right? So now, oh, okay, Phoenix College's campus, corner of 11th Avenue and Thomas, we're in the E building, right? Now we, photo, now we figure out the entryway. Where did the person come in, right? So we don't know for sure, so we photograph all, all the entrances, right? All four entrances. Well, for the downstairs. One, two, three, four. Then we photograph up and down the hallways, right? Showing the layout of this ground floor. Then we would photograph the outside of this classroom, making sure to include the number placard above the door that says E112. Then we would move our way into the, into the room. We would photograph the room. We'll talk about how we photograph the room from all four corners. It's a technique we call four cornering. And then after that, now I'm going to begin taking photographs of the body itself. If I handed you a stack of photos that were in that exact sequence, I could tell you exactly what this is and where it is without actually having to say anything. Right? So you get the concept of this outside in, we work from outside in, we tell a story with our photos. All right. Uh, photograph, um, your photos should reproduce what the photographer's eyes are seeing, and this should be able, you should be able to relate this to other people. What I mean by this is, if you remember the very first day of class, I said that a crime scene photographer's job is to do what? Okay. To take accurate photos. In other words, their, their job is to take photos that are an accurate depiction of what you saw. So that means that as we're taking photos of the crime scene, we've got to be careful not to create distortions, not to make things look bigger than they are, or smaller than they are, closer or farther away than they really are. We have to make sure we're careful not to make things look the wrong color. We don't want something that's blue to look green, something that's purple to look pink, something that's white to look yellow. So we have to be aware of that. So that means we have to be cognizant of light source, right? Which is one of the reasons we're going to use flash for most of our photos. We gotta make sure we're using the right lens focal length. So primarily what focal length are we gonna use for most of our photos? The standard lens size, which for our DSLR cameras is 35 millimeters. We may occasionally need to zoom in, may occasionally need to zoom out, but for the most part, we wanna make sure we're using that standard lens so that what our photo shows is an accurate depiction of what we actually saw. 